Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 17, Fellowship Effectively, Less Frequently, with Kenny Willenberg. I'm Mark Kane. The UCA consists of folks who believe that the Father is the one true God. Jesus is the promised Messiah, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the sprout from the root of Jesse. Jesus has a God. How about that? Jesus having a God is as natural a concept to a Unitarian Christian as Jesus walking on two legs. There is something remarkably pleasant about reading the simple passages in Scripture and just enjoying them for what they say. I spoke of caveat exemplars in episode 15, Why I'm Not a Trinitarian. That's my term, maybe not the best, but here's what I mean. Caveats act as stipulations which redirect the reader to the truth and protect them from what is likely to be a simple-minded reading of the text. They are exemplars simply because they are so useful. They are the model for dealing with New Testament authors who meant to be clear but lived 300 years too early to know how. Jesus having a God is either delightfully obvious or seriously in need of a good whack with a stipulation stick. The best theory to explain Scripture is the one with the least bruises. The UCA is committed to helping Unitarian Christians connect. It can be hard. Not everyone has personally experienced fellowship difficulties. I grew up non-Trinitarian, and the only real trauma I had early on was staying up late and arguing theology with my high school friends. And that was fun. But the UCA isn't serving people like me. Not exactly. It's more of the other way around. I serve through the UCA because I already have fellowship. I'm not isolated. Sure, the UCA provides me the joy of meeting more folks than I would have ever dreamed possible, but the real service is for those who are alone. Fellowship is a blessed thing. Being able to share openly without scorn, it's refreshing. Praying with others without having to structure your sentences to not trigger a theological debate, oh, that's nice too. You may have gone to the website UnitarianChristianAlliance.org and signed up. You then checked the directory for others near you, and maybe you found that they aren't there. Well, not yet at least. And it hurts. You may already be going on your 20th year of not really fitting in, and yep, you've signed up and still no one. I understand. We're trying here. We're doing what we can. There are many Unitarian Christians like me who have fellowship already, and many aren't really thinking about what the UCA is actually up to. It isn't easy to convince someone like this to go ahead and put a pin on their region, to let others know they're there. Isn't it just one more thing to fuss with? One more account to manage? Ugh. Yeah, it is. But I simply ask that if that's you, please do consider it. It's an opportunity to put yourself out there for others, many of whom would love to be surrounded by people like you are. People who talk about, sing about, and pray to the one true God through his Messiah, our Lord. If you are still rather isolated, this episode offers a possibility. You may be too far from others for a recurring weekly get-together, but you have other options. And, like Kenny Willenberg, if that desire burns bright within, you could go for it. Bite the bull by the horns. Wait, wait, is that right? Kenny Willenberg, I appreciate that you're joining me today. Thanks, Mark, for having me. Excited to be here. You know, the UCA's goal is to connect people. And the reason I'm talking to you today is because you are connecting people through an event that you're having. But I want to start with a bit about you so that we get the backstory. All right. So yeah, I grew up in a very strong Christian home. My parents raised me in the faith. Um, I actually grew up in the biblical Unitarian faith. My parents were previously in the Way International, mm. uh, back before I was born. Once the uh, founder of that passed away and things kind of split they kind of moved away from that and just ran their own individual home fellowships in our own house. So as long as I can remember, we had people coming over to our house, trying to fellowship and 
talk about who the one true God was. And Yeah. You grew up in what state then? Mostly Missouri. So I think Missouri since I was about six. All right. So you didn't have like a, a church fellowship, a building. You just did home fellowship your whole life. Yeah, pretty much as long back as I can remember. About how many people would you normally connect with in those situations? It varied. Um, sometimes it'd just be a handful, and sometimes we'd have a good size group, probably 15 to 20. Okay. Were there people your age there? Yeah, sometimes. And actually, a funny story was we'd go to other people's houses sometimes for fellowship too, and just to meet more people. Mm-hmm. A few times, you know, I'd be like, Dad, when can we go back to the fellowship with him again? And he'd be like, are you really interested in the teaching or you just want to go visit with people? <laughs> You know, even that early on, I was like, well, yeah, I just want to go visit with people my age because, you know, I crave that fellowship with kind of like-minded people. Yeah, yeah. Well, you started early then, as we'll see. <laughs> You've kept that up. <laughs> um, did your group at that time then have any actual affiliation or was it just... Um, it was mostly just kind of remnants of people that had been in the Way International previously or okay. maybe a few other groups that were somewhat affiliated, but there wasn't really like an official group to be a part of and... Honestly, I didn't really know if there were other biblical Unitarians out in the world, really. Always kind of felt pretty isolated. Mm. So always had that little bit of a desire to connect with more people and feel like part of something bigger than just our little group, you know? Yeah. Over the years, along with doing the home fellowships and all, my family would try to attend other traditional churches in the area. Yeah. Try to fit in best we could, but eventually yeah. doctrine would come up and it'd be a weird, awkward thing where... You didn't really feel like we had true fellowship with someone. It was just kind of like this surface level uh, trying to fit in. Mm. You know, once I got out and started working and all, I got involved with STF at that point and started going to some of their events. Okay. Well, let's pause on that and let people know what STF stands for. Yeah. So uh, STF is Spirit and Truth Fellowship um, based out of Indiana. Um, I found their website and saw that they had a event for actually 20s and 30-year-old people. So didn't know anything about that group. Um, I reached out to Jackson, who was one of the planners of that, Jackson Trigg. And he kind of filled me in the details and just took a chance and drove out to Indiana mm. for a weekend, met a whole bunch of people that I'm still friends with today. It was actually that event where I met my wife, Laura, who so ah. found another person that I liked and had the same <laughs> beliefs. So that was a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> she actually lived in Arkansas at the point. So that was only one state over, started driving back and forth and meeting up. I got to know each other's families, and she actually had a home fellowship that she was attending in that area mm. uh, with very similar beliefs and such. So I'd attend that with her when I was down there, and she'd attend our home fellowship when she came up to visit us. And you know, one thing led to another and got engaged and married, and so life goes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. Do you have a, some children? We do. We have a seven-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son. Oh, very nice. So you're still living then in Missouri. Yes. Yeah. She moved up here once we got married. Okay. Spirit and Truth Fellowship then was one of the splinter groups that came about after the Way International broke apart. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Uh, I believe the people that founded that were all priorly members of the Way International. Okay. So the 20s and 30s conference then that you went to there was quite a few years ago. I believe that was in 2009. Okay. So they were doing it back then. And at that time, it was part of that group. It was, a, it was a narrower scope. Correct. So at this point, your fellowship is still constrained to the people in your area and then some connections you've made remotely through the 20s and 30s conference. What, what happened next? So we kept doing the home fellowship idea with my parents in the area and you know, inviting everyone we'd meet and uh, some of them would join up. Sometimes the doctrinal issues would come up. They wouldn't jive with us. Uh, other times we'd fellowship for a long time until people would move away. Or Yeah. But yeah, it was always a smaller group, and we always craved more fellowship and having more connections, especially in our own age group. Mm. So uh, Laura and I actually decided, let's try to do like a 20s and 30s age group get together in Missouri, mm. uh, just because there wasn't much else in that age range going on um, that we knew of. Yeah. So we kind of scheduled out one of those and hosted a little event at our house. Very cool. So this would be stage one of your event planning career. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the goal of this is I want people to see what you did to help them think about things that they might do. You started a gathering in your area. How did you decide the content of the event? How complex or simple was it? It might be a model for somebody trying to do the same thing. Somebody who might be a little too far to drive every Sunday. 
but not too far to drive once a month or once a quarter or even once a year. So how was that event configured? Great question. Um, it was a very simple event in a lot of ways. So Laura and myself, for the most part, kind of planned the event for start to finish. Okay. My parents helped out too because they're in the area. It was pretty simple, pretty small. We did invite everyone we knew in surrounding mm. states. We originally wanted it to be primarily for 20s and 30s age group, but it turned out a lot of the people that were interested were actually in other age groups and also looking for someone to fellowship with. So mm. uh, we had found some people that actually that were in Missouri that we had never met before. So they made it out. Oh, wow. Uh, we had people come from Iowa, uh, Kentucky, which was the truest. They made it out. Actually, interesting with Missouri is there's like seven states that border it. So we have a lot of neighbors. Oh, my. We actually had Jackson and Hannah Trigg, who we had met at the first STF 20s and 30s uh -huh. conference. They actually made it out all the way from New Mexico. Oh. Very long drive. Oh, yeah. So it was a great event. Very simple. We just kind of planned out some basic meals. We invited some of the people that were coming out to actually share and teach at it. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have any super high quality production or anything like that. It was just more of a get together, eat together, fellowship, get to know each other. So was this in your house? It was, yeah. We think it was something around like 25 people is all. Okay. So not a, not a real big group, but... Did it go overnight or was it all packed into one day? I believe we did a Saturday and then like a Sunday morning. Okay. Yeah, that's nice and simple. It could be even probably simpler than that if somebody else wanted to try something. Just say, we'll do it for an afternoon. You know, you could get people who could drive two hours in the morning and then drive back that night. So there's a lot of possibilities for people. Yeah. There was a simplicity to it that kind of made it more organic hmm. allowed us to connect to each other rather than it being like this conference where it's sit down at this specific time everyone listen to a speaker and then you go your way yeah so some ways i think keeping it simple if you're wanting to connect is the best and but really you could make it as simple or complex as you want i mean you could literally just invite people over for a barbecue once a month and just hmm. fellowship about the scripture and who god is and what's going on in each other's lives i think there's a lot of value to that was that something you repeated or did you just do it the one time? So for that, we just ended up doing it the one time. But at that event, we got connected with Truitts and the Triggs. Mm -hmm. We kind of said, hey, it'd be really nice if we could connect together more often and find a way to stay connected. So we actually, by kind of the idea of John Truitt, started the virtual fellowship together. Mm. And all of us stayed in contact that way. Maybe a year or two later from that, John Truitt decided to kind of have an event at his house. Okay. Uh, being located in Kentucky, he's a little bit closer to a few other groups. So we had a little bit better chance of getting more participation that way. So we okay. started planning kind of a 20s and 30s conference at his place mm. annually. So I think the first year we did that was 2017, I want to say. Oh, okay. And then we've been doing it ever since. Okay. At this point, the event wasn't a kind of a throw the doors open for Unitarian Christians. It was still related to the people who had been connected through the Way International in the past. Is that right? For the most part. I don't know that we really intentionally did that. It's just those were the people we knew at the point. Okay. So we know that the reason that you're on the UCA podcast in the first place is because the event as it's structured now is much broader than your original group. When did that transition happen? Yeah. So the first year we did it was a fairly small size group, mostly because it was Spirit and Truth Fellowship people and, you know, X-Way group people. Mm -hmm. uh, but at that event, we kind of had this idea, let's make this bigger and connect more and more people. And over the time, especially John Truett had started reaching out to these other groups and getting connected with them. Everyone was really excited to find out that there was a whole other world of biblical Unitarians out there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was before the UCA, so you couldn't just pull it up on the map and be like, hey, here's some people to reach out to. How did you find these people? Yeah. So some of it was just through Facebook. Have a friend in common with someone else and mm -hmm. that has another friend. So it kind of just grew from there. Okay. So after the first year, it was officially deliberately bigger. Yeah, we wanted to make it as inclusive as possible. And with the focus of trying to reach out to different groups, we tried to kind of narrow it to, you know, being more fellowship oriented and, you know, encouraging and uniting people and connecting people, hmm. um, especially on the idea of the one true God, rather than trying to say, we want everyone to agree with us 100% on everything. Hmm. It was more like, let's just unite on what we agree on. And we can talk about what we disagree about, but it's not like a big issue about it and try to just be divisive. Let's try to unite people. Yeah, that mindset predates the formation of the UCA, you were already doing it. Well, it's similar, in fact, to that other event that we had a few years back called Converge, which was like your 20s and 30s conference completely blown open, inviting people from everywhere of all ages. We'll talk about Converge in a later podcast because some people didn't go. I think we could have a really great podcast describing what that was like because that was a super broad event. 
yeah, from my understanding and talking with these people that came from these different groups, a lot of people had that same mindset that they felt kind of isolated alone and didn't realize that there's whole other organizations out there that share very similar beliefs Mm -hmm. and really similar, you know, commitments to honoring the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ. You know, that's a really powerful thing to be isolated and not have that connection. Then when you meet someone else and it's just like an amazing connection, that's like instantly form this bond. Yeah. Now your role with this group, what, what is your position in the arranging of this 20s and 30s conference? So as far as this one, I'm kind of helping to just organize and uh, lead everything. Mm-hmm. So we have a whole group of people that are on a planning committee. I guess I'm kind of keeping everyone on task and mm-hmm. that type of thing. What are some of the things you're doing in the design of the event, in the way you've laid it out and how you've structured it, that facilitate this broader outreach scope? One of the ways we do that is we try to make it focused on fellowship and connecting people. Mm -hmm. We don't have a agenda as far as trying to indoctrinate anybody to a certain belief or anything like that. It's more of let's get together and encourage each other. Mm -hmm. Something else that we've done is try to be uh, deliberate in who we invite to come speak at the event. We try to bring in people from different groups and different organizations. So you have a different variety of opinions and speakers. You know, if someone has someone from their group that they know and they trust and they know that they're going to be speaking at the event, they're probably going to be more likely to come out and listen to them than if you just say, hey, come listen to me. I'm going to talk to you the whole time. When you talk about speakers, is it like a service or just somebody who's there? I mean, it's in a home, right? It's not like you have a sanctuary. Yeah, it's a little more informal. I mean, we do typically kind of set some chairs up and arrange it where you have someone up in front Mm -hmm. speaking to the group. Uh, It is in a home, so it's kind of a big living room area. So it is a little bit more of an intimate environment, not have someone up on a stage preaching down at you or something. But (laughs) yeah, usually as far as like the sharing, we leave it pretty open. They decide what they would like to share. Okay, Uh, We usually have a theme and ask them to keep it in line with that. Hmm. Uh, But it's not so much of a sermon as someone sharing maybe their experience or something they see from the Bible or a different way of uh, viewing things. Mm -hmm. What can somebody expect if they came to a 20s and 30s event? Yeah. So each year we've tweaked it just a little bit more, try to make it better and improve it each year. We do have a planning committee that tries to organize different things, different activities, as well as the teachings. Mm -hmm. So we want to have teaching that people can come and learn something and experience that. But we've really tried hard to make it also an experience where people can get to know each other, where they can fellowship, just hang out, visit, and build those connections. So we purposely have built in a lot of free time, Mm -hmm. and that could be anything that people will kind of want to do in that free time. But we also will try to offer some more structured activities as well. And that could be anything from going out and playing disc golf, going to a coffee shop. Skydiving? Not done that one yet. Well, (laughs) all right. One of the things that I enjoy is just going to the brewery and hanging out with some people and just talking about the Bible over a good craft beer with some people. Mm And (laughs) people might give you some funny looks like, why are these people in here talking about the Bible? But (laughs) it's a good time just to relax and just be real and share your heart. It tends to be one of the... uh, favorite parts of the event each year. A lot of people like to go and (laughs) hang out. So I don't know. I don't know about these people, (laughs) but how many days does this run now? Is it still just a one night event or do you have it stretched longer? Yeah. So typically we're doing two and a half days, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday morning, get a good full size event in there. Especially if some people traveling a little farther, it's nice to give them their travels worth. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Of course we eat together. I know John Truitt is all about making great food. (laughs) He's been perfecting some barbecue and that type of thing for years now. So eating together is a big part of just fellowshipping. Mm -hmm. We typically also will do communion together at some point. Mm. I believe it was last time we did a foot washing together with everyone. Wow. Uh, Typically we'll have times as well for praying and ministering for people. Mm -hmm. Just meet with a little small group in a more intimate setting where it's not just in front of everyone in the whole group. Yeah. Um, This year, we're actually trying to do something a little bit more specific with small groups where we're going to pair each group off into little smaller groups to really try to build a deeper connection within those groups of five to 10 people Mm -hmm. where people do get like that lasting deep friendship. All right. So Kenny, if somebody was thinking, maybe we could pull this off out here in North Dakota, Newfoundland, wherever they might be, what would be some of the things that you would suggest they think about as they make these plans? Just from your own experience, you've done it enough years in a row. Yeah. Well, first off, I would just encourage someone that's thinking along those lines to just give it a shot. You know, worst you have to lose is that no one shows up. (laughs) Most likely you'll find somebody that's also desiring to have that connection and willing to make the drive out and meet Mm -hmm. up. And it is a lot of work. The organization, Mm -hmm. the planning, 
uh, the process. You'll want to start that months in advance just to make sure there's time to not just get organized, but also to invite people and get on their schedule. Mm. Um, as far as like the specifics of the work, it's just a lot of setting things up with a schedule, picking the date, filling in the content of what you want to do with the event, and just either if you're going to schedule it out and be kind of rigid with that, or if you're going to have free time, I think it's best to be deliberate with that and kind of give people some guidance and what to expect and what they can look forward to. Because if you just tell people, hey, we're going to have an event and don't really know what it's going to be yet, they're probably not going to be super interested in attending. But mm -hmm. if you can give the uh, the details of, hey, we're going to have lunch together, we're going to go and do this activity together, we're going to study the scripture in this area together, encourage each other this way. I think that really does help. I think probably the biggest thing is just connecting people, letting them know about it. Sometimes that's the hardest thing. It's just getting the word out there. Mm. Different Facebook groups. If you have other people that you know of, and even in other areas, reach out to them, let them know. And they might know other people that are closer to you and send them your way as well. Mm -hmm. But then I would say just don't have huge expectations of it. it has to be a certain way. Be willing to adjust to the demand that you see. So if there's only a handful of other people that are interested in it, uh, maybe start off with an afternoon barbecue once a month or even less frequent than that. Mm -hmm. Because I think once you start building a connection with other people, things tend to naturally just grow out of that. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages of the UCA directory that we put on UnitarianChristianAlliance.org, if you sign up there, anybody can reach out to you through that contact form and you get an email from them. Sometimes on Facebook, you might see somebody, hey, I live in uh, northern Nevada. Is there any Unitarian Christians around here? Well, that's, that's fine to mention that in Facebook. But after that conversation drifts down after three days and nobody sees it anymore, you might not actually be catching everybody in Nevada. But if you look on the UCA website and you check your area, you might see six or seven people that you can send an email to. As long as they can get their email, you could tell them about an event coming up in a few months. Yeah, absolutely. I think the UCA is a really great tool for just that type of thing, trying to network and connect with other people. That's something else I would suggest, you know, if, if you're in that type of place where you're looking to connect with more people, mm -hmm. maybe start going to visit other people events and try to connect and meet people that way. Because once you make a connection with someone and they get to know you and your friends, they're going to be a lot more likely to come out to your event and help you plan it or organize it as well. Yeah, that's good. Well, the reason that we are talking about your event now is because it squarely fits under the UCA concept, connecting people across all of these lines. When I first found out about this event, I think it was John Truitt, he asked me, he's like, hey, can you announce this on the podcast? I'm like, well, I want the podcast to have a very long life. They call it evergreen in the industry. It just means that somebody could listen to it in 15 years and find it just as valuable as the day that it came out. So I'm not so sure that the podcast is the best way to do it because some people pick up the episodes months after they are released because they're just busy. It's not an ideal way for timely announcements. So by having you on, Kenny, and talking about how you made the event, I think it's of way more value than just, hey, there's an event in Paducah, Kentucky, first weekend of June. Y'all want to go? You know, <laughs> Right, yeah. And as much as we'd all love to have everyone attend this event, even more so, we'd love everyone to start having their own events rather than there be one 20s and 30s conference. You know, in Paducah, Kentucky, we maybe have five or six or 10 throughout the country. Mm -hmm. That's all spread out. And I'd love to attend as many as possible that I could go to. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that would be a nice excuse to travel, actually. If somebody's having one of these events in northern Illinois, somebody's having one in Minnesota, and somebody else sees it on the list and they're like, hey, you know, I was traveling up there for business. Hey, honey, what do you say we reach out to them and maybe just stay that whole weekend and participate in an event and meet a new group of people? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. Laura and I did something similar to that when we had the Converge event. Mm. Laura and I made our family vacation around that where we drove up there because it was a long drive. Yeah. And then we took in the other sites and visited some other places and made a whole trip out of it. And it was, it was awesome. Yeah. It's exciting to think that these things could be happening simply because we are connecting people. That's really all it is. You get two or three people connected. One of them has an idea. One of them hears this podcast and like, let's do it. Yeah. So there's a possibility, Kenny, that talking about it here on the podcast might give you more interest than you can fit into John Truitt's house. Do you have an upper, uh, like a cap where, well, you know, we'll probably stop at 400 people and, you know, then that's, we'll, we'll draw the line there. I mean, suppose it blows up and you have that many people interested in coming. Well, it'd be an awesome problem to have, but uh, I think for having it at a house, the upper limit is about 50 people. 
Mm. More than that, we're going to have to look at finding another venue, which wouldn't be the worst problem by any means. Yeah. We'd love to have a, a vent so big that we have to change our whole plans. But yeah, how soon in advance is it good to know these are the expected attendees? So I think you should set your goal, but then have a contingency plan because you really won't know until very close. Some people tend to cancel last minute. Mm. Even if you say you have to register a month in advance, you'll get people calling you like, you know, a week before, like, hey, I just saw this. My schedule opened up. Can I still come out and make it? We, of course, try to be as accommodating as we can anyway. We never want to turn anyone away. But uh, so I would say realize that you will probably need to be flexible. And if you're trying to get the best attendance, try to accommodate people as best you can. Mm -hmm. Now, some people might think, well, isn't the only way you can plan an event to have like an online website where people go in and sign up? And I know you can do that. That's a legitimate tool. And there are websites that offer that service and you can pay for it. But I'm guessing it could be done very simply. Is that how you've done it in the past? Yeah. So, I mean, this year we do have like an online registration link that people can go to and uh, complete. And we've done that in former years as well. I can get you the link for the registration so you can put it in the show notes. Okay. I will do that. But earlier on when it was simpler, it was just something as simple as do a phone call, text, email, and just say, hey, I'm planning on being there. And what do I need to do? What do I need to look forward to? And mm -hmm. like I said, it can be as simple or as complex as you want to make it. Yeah. That's cool, though. You have a, a website. Is it a simple like a Google form or did you actually subscribe to a event planning service? So what we've got this year is just a survey through, I believe, MailChimp mm. that we can promote that out on Facebook and people can get that link and just complete the little form and it emails us the details and mm. kind of adds them to a list. OK, yeah, that's nice and simple. And I know Google Forms are like that, too, where you could just set up a handful of questions and just share the link and wait for people to fill them in. Yeah, I've done that before as well. Yeah. If somebody was interested, how would they go about getting the information to you? Yeah, so what we've done is have a Facebook group, 20s and 30s Christian Conference. We've used that same one year after year. So once people connect to it every year, they're kind of notified of it. Okay. So that's the easiest way. If somebody wasn't on Facebook, what would they do then? Well, uh, reach out to me would be the easiest way. Okay. I'm on the UCA website, which is a great resource for people to be able to connect with other people. You didn't name yourself Kittens41 on your outward facing name, did you? <laughs> no, I, I left my real name. It should be under Kenny Willenberg, I believe. All right, well, that's good. So Kenny Willenberg and they'd find it, they could reach out right through that as well. Okay, great. So Kenny, you mentioned Converge, but I know there are a few people who probably missed that entirely. Do uh, you wanna just say a few words about that? I do plan to have a show later, but I want people to at least not feel completely lost here. Yeah, so Converge was a fairly large event that was held in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of different groups that were involved in that and invited with that and participate. So it's almost like an even bigger version of what we're talking about here with the 20s and 30s conference, just taken up to a whole nother level. Uh, so that was something that I really enjoyed going to and uh, would like to see more of those at some point in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was over 300 people, I believe. It spread a wide gamut. We had some people that came from overseas as well. Yeah. I do want to have a whole show about that because that event was part of, I think, what sparked a lot of interest in a lot of people. Like, wait a minute, we could do this more often. And hey, there are a lot more of us out there than I originally thought. I'm going to have that be a topic so that folks can really sense what that was and how it meant so much to many people who came. Awesome. That was in 2019, thankfully before COVID hit so that we actually could do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is great. Well, Kenny, I appreciate that you could share these details. Is there anything you would want to add to encourage people who might still be thinking about this and maybe teetering a little bit? Yeah, I would just encourage people to step out and do it. I don't have any special skills or training in this, and I'm pretty rough around the edges. <laughs> but you know what? I just did what I could, did my best, and learned and grew from there. So if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> I would encourage you, if you can link up with someone that's good at that type of thing and good at planning, and you know, just work something out together. It's mm -hmm. definitely worth it to meet and connect with other people. Mm, that's excellent. Kenny Willenberg, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. I got two responses to episode 16, Bible Feed Podcast, with the two Christadelphians from the UK. Hi, this is Andrew from the UK, also from the Midlands. I'm very impressed with your UCA podcasts, enjoyed them, and I've listened to I think almost every one of them. I was most impressed that you've chosen to speak to Christadelphians, being a Christadelphian myself. However, I was very surprised to know that Dan and Mark were doing a podcast themselves because I had no idea. 
So I wonder how much else is being done by Christadelphians along these lines, but I don't know about. Anyway, thank you very much for enlightening me with regard to that. I've got even more podcasts to listen to. God bless you in your efforts. And yeah, have a great time. Thanks, Andrew. I love moments of delightful discovery, just like this. My dad used to sometimes ask at the dinner table, what was your serendipity today? A serendipity is a happy chance occurrence, an unexpected bit of joy that dropped in on your day just for smiles. I'm not sure, but he may have been tuning my brain in my formative years. He may have been training me to detect and delight in small happy surprises. Because now, I find them everywhere, and I find joy in some of the silliest, smallest things. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. Pretty much every experience I've had putting this podcast together has been soaked in and pickled by serendipity. It's been a hoot. You have helped make it that way, and I appreciate that. Mark, this is Kent Wheeler again. Enjoyed your broadcast. That was really good. The thing about it is, is that the ones I've had experience with, the Christadelphians here in town, they're not real friendly. So I just wanted to tell you that. But anyway, I'm still on my journey, and I really enjoy your programs. I think you're doing a good thing. Thanks for everything. Bye. Thanks, Kent. This is a virtually universal problem. Dan acknowledged it in the previous episode. We are talking about people. And no matter what form or shape a fellowship may take, no one is impervious to becoming very inward-focused. Your experience with that one group is unfortunate, but it is an example for all of us to reflect on. There but by the grace of God go I. It isn't just other people who close off outsiders. We do it too. Or at least we are entirely capable of doing it, And sometimes we just need an excuse to do it. New people can be messy. They can say things we don't agree with. They can have problems in their life that we don't want to deal with. They may be hungry and we, well, we have appointments and important things to do. It is so easy to shut off others. So the right response, Kent, to this kind of situation is to resolve with even more determination to not let this happen to us. I'm humbled every time I read Jesus' depiction of Judgment Day in Matthew 25, 31. He separates the sheep and the goats not based on their statements of faith or the name of their denomination. He, He talks an awful lot about caring for people in need. Man, that is so much harder than signing a statement of faith. Hang in there, Kent love others, and do good at every opportunity. We have a king who thoroughly gets what we're dealing with here. He's our own brother who loves us, and he's sitting next to God now and helping us endure to the end. He'll get us through. Also, what makes this UCA thing so cool is Dan Weatherall from the UK, the Bible feed host from the previous episode. He's chatted with Kent just to see if there's anything he could do to help. Just think about that. Someone in the central plains of the USA is talking with a guy from the UK. That's serendipitous. People are people. And sometimes we meet them and just have to turn around and move on. At least now we have a new tool in our fellowship finding toolbox. The UCA. With more opportunities to search around, you don't have to settle with whatever Unitarian group is up the road. Sometimes you don't really want to. Some groups are not healthy. You are not obligated to stay someplace like that. The UCA can help you reach out further and find others. Maybe you end up with a small group of two or three people. Maybe the three of you see the other 12 that are within a four-hour drive. Maybe you might consider firing up the barbecue to have an adventurous day making some new friends. Kenny, thanks for taking the time to talk about what you do. Your desire for reaching out and connecting is clearly evident. Thanks for taking that impulse and doing something with it. You're making a difference for others 
and it is infectious in a good way. Not to be confused with other less desirable types of infectious things, which may be a topic in this, the year of our Lord, 2021. But thanks, Kenny. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well.